be a top seven fantasy quarterback this season. We're keeping this realistic here. We know that nobody would think that he'll be in the top three, probably not even the top five. How about top seven, George? Buy or sell? You know, if he stays healthy, top five is not out of question here at all. He's a running quarterback. We know how valuable, uh, valuable they can be. My worry is going to be what I mentioned when we talked about the uh, – the Indianapolis Colts. Boy, man, Pittman would go down. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot to throw. He'll be running for his life half the uh, time there. Uh, I like Pittman a lot. Small sample size of what we saw of what he's going to be. I played the five games that I picked before the injury here. Uh, so, for a longer season, we'll see if he gets to catch up to him, what he can do. He's been out the pretty control of the ball. He'll be down the field here. I'm going to buy this. All right? I'm going to buy. I, I want to buy on Anthony Richardson. I want him to be that guy because I want to see the excitement that he can bring. Uh, that I I think, you know, smart money might say take the, go the other way because there's so many quarterbacks in that tier that, hey, he could have a good year and still not finish top seven. That being said, I think he will show just like he did last year. He's going to be dynamic. I'm buying top seven. Yeah, it reminds me so much of, of Cam Newton uh, in the early days too. I'm going to sell. I'm going to sell on this. I, I think it's too high. I, I think most leagues... Uh, take away points for interceptions if that's the case. I think his numbers are going to be 20 something touchdowns, 15, 16 something interceptions. That's going to negate some stuff. Um, yes, he will run. Can he play an entire season? Still very questionable for me. I, I have him as the ninth best fantasy quarterback at the end of the season, just outside the top seven. So I'm going to go sell on that. Good morning. Welcome to Newswire here on Sports Grid. Craig Mish with you here on this Tuesday. We'll recap Monday night football. Not much of a match last night between the New York Jets and San Francisco 49ers. Matthew Lutovsky from Sporting News will be with us. We will discuss it as well. Also, a quick turnaround for the NFL this week. They play on Thursday. Buffalo, Miami, Dan Fates will join us. We'll go over the very latest in the National Football League news notes information. And, of course, potential picks against the spread. Also, Sam McQuillan is our guest contributor from Legal Sports Report, we, of course, have a ton of information to give to you in college football as well. Games on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday this week. But naturally, the top story in the National Football League continues to be the story about Tyreek Hill, the Miami Dolphins wide receiver, being detained prior to their game against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Late yesterday, police body cam video was released that showed the police taking Hill out of the car putting him onto the ground and handcuffing him while Hill was trying to call it would appear his his agent I believe or or the team security director both are named Drew so one of the two as uh, Hill was saying that he had knee surgery and he was on the ground there were also video of Calais Campbell defensive lineman trying to come to Tyreek Hill's aid and naturally there's been a lot of discussion about this on social media but first let's give you the opinions we'll start from the Miami Dade Police Department, the president of the South Florida Police Benevolent Association, released a statement. Now, this statement was released, I want to make sure you understand this, prior to the video coming out. Again, prior to the video, saying that before the Dolphins game yesterday, an incident occurred where Tyreek Hill was placed in handcuffs before being released. To be clear, at no time was he ever under arrest. He was being detained for officer safety after driving in a manner which he was putting himself and others in great danger. Upon being stopped, Hill was not cooperative immediately with the officers on the scene. They placed him in handcuffs. Mr. Hill, still uncooperative, refused to sit on the ground and was therefore redirected to the ground. And naturally speaking, the Miami Dolphins have their own opinions of this, as to a lot of people who saw the video as well. Very specifically, the Dolphins are obviously shocked by saying in a release late yesterday, we are saddened by the overly aggressive and violent conduct directed toward Tyreek Hill Calais Campbell, and Jonu Smith by police officers before yesterday's game. Again, this was released yesterday. It was both maddening and heartbreaking to watch the very people we trust to protect our community use such unnecessary force and hostility toward these players, 
Yet it's a reminder that not, not every situation ends in peace, as we are grateful that this one did. So stay tuned to see what happens in the future with Tyreek Hill and uh, certainly the Miami-Dade Police Department, a story that is not yet completed. Meanwhile, a new story with Deshaun Watson, yet again being sued by an individual that claims that Watson committed sexual assault while on a date with this person several years ago. Of course, Watson was sued, missed a lot of time in the NFL. The lawsuits are different. For the, this was different than those other lawsuits that happened previously with the massage places. Deshaun Watson just can't get out of his own way. Let's just be honest. All right, the Buffalo Bills, not funny, I guess, but it's just you know, just continual stories about Deshaun Watson off the field while this guy can't even play well on the field. That's just a fact. Buffalo Bills have extended right tackle Spencer Brown. Four years, $72 million. This just coming down via NFL Network. We'll update this story for you with Dan Fates, who covers the Bills, coming up. $45 million guaranteed. Congrats to Spencer Brown. Last night in the NFL... Started off looking like the Jets could give the San Francisco 49ers a game last night. Didn't feel that way as the game went on. The big story from the game, by the way, happened beforehand where Christian McCaffrey was declared inactive, unbeknownst to anyone, I guess. Although after the game, the starting running back said he knew about it on Friday and then sort of walked it back post game. But needless to say, the 49ers pick up the win very easy, 32 to 19. This game was not close uh, from the second half on. Uh, Jordan Mason was the star of this one, rushed for over 150 yards in the game. He was fantastic for them. Brock Purdy also dissected the Jets defense, who gave up scores on eight different drives. That's exactly what you're looking for. And despite all of the distractions, McCaffrey out, Trent Williams holding out, Brandon Ayuk holding out, their head coach Kyle Shanahan said they had a really good preseason and none of it affected them. Yeah, I mean, our, I mean, I'm with our team every day, so I know there's lots of news stories and stuff with holdouts and things like that, and when are people coming back? But I mean, our guys have been awesome in practice. They've been very focused. You know, anytime guys don't get a lot of practice in, you know, I wish we could have more. So I wanted to mesh more with those guys who just got here this week. But being able to get four practices in with those guys, having the extra day, um, things like that, was great for them. Um, still got a long way to go today. By no means was perfect. Uh, there were some parts that were sloppy, but. Uh, just overall, all three phases um, played really well together. Um, being able to score there at the end of the half and with the field goal, run the clock out, score the opening drive of the third quarter, our defense getting the two turnovers, our kicker going six for six. Being able to have 37 runs, um, I look at that as a complete team goal that we try to do. So uh, I was real happy with just the team overall. Let's move on to the rest of the news in the National Football League. We got news late yesterday. The Los Angeles Rams are going to be without their star wide receiver, Puka Nakua, for at least several weeks. Nakua was placed on injured reserve by the Rams, and so don't expect him to see him in reality or fantasy, by the way, for the Rams over the next month. Rome Odunze, week to week with an MCL sprain for the Chicago Bears. He was hurt in Sunday's game against the Tennessee Titans. The Green Bay Packers will not put Jordan Love on injured reserve, which is good news for them. It means he can come back sooner than four weeks, although Malik Willis is going to start for the Packers this week. And also Kadarius Toney has a new destination. This time he signs with the Cleveland Browns. All right, big week ahead in college football once again. Texas A&M and the SEC visits Gainesville and the Florida Gators. And after a really strong week last week, DJ Lagway looks like he's earned some playing time with Florida. Billy Napier saying yesterday that he will use both starter Graham Mertz and Lagway against the Aggies this coming week. Oklahoma State's linebacker Colin Oliver is going to be sidelined for an extended period of time because of a foot injury. Three-time All-Big 12 selection. He left their game against Arkansas in the first half with the foot injury, was on crutches. He's going to miss, looks like, at least a month. Northwestern is panicking early on in their football season. Maybe they should. They're making a quarterback change after two games. Jack Lausch is going to start this week against Eastern Illinois. David Brown made the, David Braun made the announcement yesterday. Mike Wright was their starter. He did not throw a touchdown pass. Didn't look uh, very good as well. All right, let's get to some more college football news, notes, and information. We move now to the Oklahoma Sooners. Offensive lineman Gary and Hatchett, a transfer from Washington, is going to miss the rest of the season after undergoing season-ending surgery. Oklahoma has some big issues on their offensive line going into this week. 
The Pitt Panthers have fired their athletic director, Heather Like. This happened yesterday, saying that they're seeking a new vision for their college. And also, Lane Kiffin takes a shot at the fans in Mississippi, saying we were crushing the team in the first half. I get it, but you got to stay in the second half of our games and support the team. That's what he said on a Zoom call yesterday. Lane Kiffin never afraid to say anything to the media. All right, in Major League Baseball yesterday, was it the last start of the season for Paul Skeens? If so, he struck out nine over six solid innings in a win Monday, 3-2 to victory as the Pirates beat the Marlins. The AL East race is heating up. The Yankees beat the Royals. The Orioles lost to the Red Sox, so now the Yankees are up by a game and a half. In the NL wildcard race, the Mets win again. They beat the Jays 3-2, to two, and the Braves were shut out yet again yesterday, this time to the Cincinnati Reds. The final was one to nothing there. And also, the Texas Rangers make an announcement, although they are on the brink of being sort of in the postseason race. They're pushing forward. Kumar Rocker will be recalled, and he will make his first start of the season as a rookie for the Texas Rangers. All right, coming up next, we recap what happened on Monday Night Football. Convincing win for the San Francisco 49ers, this despite not having their star running back in Christian McCaffrey. What does it mean moving forward? And are we overreacting at all with what we saw from the Jets' defense? Matt Latovsky joins us next to discuss from Sporting News right after the break. A new era in CFB to start off this year, put on full display. My take on this game is simple. I, I know some people will be upset about it. Good riddance to the Pac-12. Can you do it in terms of the week to week to week? I don't see a pathway for this team to miss the college football playoffs. We want to make sure you have those best bets in the entirety of our betting cards. That was Tony Lincoln! But he had that he program! Give us Tony going there. There. Only on Sports Grid. And four grabs in the first half for just over 30 yards, was injured, came back in briefly, and then had to be carted off. We were pessimistic on Puka Nakua's injury to the same right knee of that being a nothing, just a bursa, and that's it, as per Sean McVay. Uh, we felt there could be a small PCL component. The early line, only on Sports Grid. You know what? What can one of these quarterbacks or wide receivers do for me this year to make a wager? It's got to be the running conditions there for Jaden Daniels. In regards to Jaden Daniels, you know I was on him in regards to the Heisman Trophy. I actually think he's going to do it on the ground, through the air, 40 touchdowns, four interceptions, playing in Cliff Kingsbury's offense where he wants to spread it and throw it. I think he's going to put up dynamic numbers. Pro football today, only on Sports Grid. The sharpest football contest show in the land. The Las Vegas Football Contest Show focuses on Circus Sports Million, Circus Survivor, and the Westgate Super Contest, handicapping the games and releasing our contest picks every week of the season. With two former Super Contest winners, Brady Cannon and James Salinas, a former NFL player, Mike Pritchard, and over $1 million in contest prize money won combined, the Las Vegas Football Contest Show will have you prepared this season like none other. Virtually every primetime game we've seen up until Monday Night Football was right down to the wire. So naturally, we expected to get it done. We finally got one on Monday Night Football as the 49ers uh, basically dominated the New York Jets in every facet and especially offensively, which I guess was shocking to see the Jets play poor defense. Let, let's bring in Matt Latovsky from Sporting News to break it all down. And, uh, you know, Matt, the, the line is what it was. You know, a lot of smart people really thought the Jets would keep this close, maybe even win the game. And then you open up with McCaffrey being out and you thought, wow, like this could be legit. Jets could win. 
uh, you know, Jets score a touchdown. You see Rodgers throwing the ball to Wilson. You're feeling like, okay, they're going to stay in the game. And then, my gosh, the second half, they just got torn apart on the ground. Yeah, they did. And, you know, I think that if you're a Jets fan, you can look at some positives, which was, you know, we mostly held them to field goals against most teams. Field goals, if you hold teams to field goals, you're going to win the game. But you can't give up six mixed with a couple touchdowns. And uh, and so from that standpoint, it was a little bit mixed. You know, you're not going to play one of the best teams in the NFL every week. And there's no doubt that the 49ers are one of, you know, to me, one of the three best teams in the NFL, uh, certainly one of the top five. And that made it tough. You're playing on the road. It's your quarterback's first game in a year. So there was definitely a lot of things working against the Jets, but you thought the defense would be there. You thought the defense would travel. I think we saw all week that defense was ahead of offense, which isn't, you know, unusual for early in a season like this, week one especially. So a mixed bag, I think ultimately you're disappointed, but at the same time, you lost on the road to the 49ers. You were expected to lose this game. You're 0-1. That's the big thing that matters, and you kind of move on and you just try to improve. So uh, some positives, some negatives, but if you're a Jets fan, like I said, you you were supposed to lose this game. You had this one circled with an L on it, and now you can move on. Yeah, look, I, I think Jets fans would just you know be disappointed with the way that the defense played. I think overall, and they don't mind that, but the game wasn't really close. Aaron Rodgers uh, you know, 167 yards. This has been like a theme in the NFL, like the like quarterbacks throwing for under 200 yards across the board. It's sort of not just Rodgers, but bizarre to see this. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, the flip side of this was to see what happened on the side of the San Francisco 49ers, Matt, which is sometimes you're going to get players that perform when they replace others. But I guess I would have to ask you this, Matt. Are we seeing what reminds me of, and I don't know how far back you go with reality and fantasy here, but it sure seems like whoever is the running back for the 49ers is like the running back for the Denver Broncos many years ago when Terrell Davis was playing and Mike Anderson and Orlandis Gary, and it just didn't matter who it was. They were like the number one running back in fantasy football. I mean, I, I, I have to feel that way at this point. Nothing against Mason. But 147 yards against the Jets and a touchdown? I mean, the numbers are incredible. Yeah, he was running all over them. And, yeah, you mentioned those guys, Ruben Jones, Tata Bell. I mean, we could, Jones, we could yeah. keep going on. I mean, it's it's, it's the Shanahan connection. And, and that's just what it feels like. And, you know, Jordan Mason came into that game with a career 5.6 yards per carry. He's always been a very tough runner. He's always been good when called upon in small doses. You know, you mentioned the yardage, which was impressive, but 20, 28 carries. You know, that's what I'm looking at. The fact that he just kept getting the ball and he kept pounding it and uh, kept doing well. You know, they it felt like they were running Debo Samuel a lot, too. And he wasn't yeah. having quite as much success running the ball. But, yeah, certainly Jordan Mason was. And, I, yeah, that's just what they do. They run the ball. They run the ball effectively. It's why getting Trent Williams in there was so important. That guy's the rock to that whole team as far as I'm concerned, certainly on the offensive line. And they can just do it. And when they have talented running backs, you know, they unearth guys like Jordan Mason who are tough runners and who just, you know, can go at a moment's notice. That's when you know this is a really dangerous team. And it'll be really interesting to see. If they try to bring Christian McCaffrey back week two, they're playing a game against Minnesota. It's on the road, but nonetheless, a team you expect to beat, even though they look pretty good in week one. You know, do you need Christian McCaffrey? I don't think you ever want to take anything for granted. We saw them lose in Minnesota last year in a similar situation with some banged up players like that. But, uh, you know, they might try to give him another rest, sneak him through and uh, and focus on getting him healthy for the rest of the season. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I don't personally don't see any way he plays this week. And and again, it's not about week two; it's about week seventeen. They got to have they, they are built to try and win a Super Bowl. So I don't see it. I think Mason's going to roll again. Stinks for me, <laughs> but that's just the reality of it. Forty uh, ers five and a half point favorites, though. I mean, this seems this seems like a pretty big overreaction uh, off the win last night at Minnesota. And I'm, I'm not saying that Sam Darnold is the best quarterback in the universe, and, and they did play one of the worst teams in the NFL in the Giants, but I, I feel like this may end up being a close game. How about you? Yeah, for sure. You know, we know how this works. Week one, everyone overreacts. We think certain teams are better than they are. Other teams are worse than they are. And then week two, we have a little correction, and people go, hey, wait a minute. 
I thought the Panthers were going to go 0 and 17. How come they just beat the Chargers, who looked awesome in week one? These things happen all the time. Now, do I think it's going to happen here? I don't. I thought the Vikings played above their head. And like you said, it was against the Giants, which certainly helped. Uh, the 49ers know Sam Darnold very well since he was, he's been there, uh, you know, in, in the recent past. So I think that's going to be an interesting game. But you got a team short week right away. Brandon Ayuk didn't look like he was nearly at 100%. 100%. Yeah. We saw Trent Williams go in and get an IV late in the game. He probably still has some conditioning to do. So this is definitely a trap game. For the 49ers, I think Brock Purdy has to play a little better than he did. I thought he missed some throws, you know, lost in the in the hoopla of all the running and how, how well Jordan Mason played. So it's going to be a very, very interesting game. And five and a half, you're right, I, it does seem a little rich. Yeah, and, and try to help me figure out how the Titans didn't cover this one. I, I think I saw the, the NFL record for teams, five minutes to go and a half, up 17 nothing, getting points were 63-1. and one against the spread in the history of the NFL, and the Titans lost the game outright, didn't cover. Jets four-and-a-half-point favorites at Tennessee. I got to wait till later in the week to make a decision on this one. I don't know what to think of either team, Matt. Yeah, it's almost impossible. That's what it felt like. I, I, I personally like the Jets. I think the Titans. I thought they'd have an offense. The defense was, wasn't was going to be there, and uh, we didn't see an offense, uh, and the defense was there. I don't know if that's going to be the case against the Jets. Yeah, the Titans gave the game away. Thanks again, Matt. We'll see you soon. in CFB to start off this year, put on full display. My take on this game is simple. I, I know some people will be upset about it. Good riddance to the Pac-12. Can you do it in terms of the week to week to week? I don't see a pathway for this team to miss the college football playoffs. We want to make sure you have those best bets in the entirety of our betting cards. That was so thinking, But he had that he program to was going there. Only on Sports Grid. Again, four grabs in the first half for just over 30 yards, was injured, came back in briefly, and then had to be carted off. We were pessimistic on Puka Nakua's injury to the same right knee of that being a nothing, just a bursa, and that's it, as per Sean McVay. Uh, we felt there could be a small PCL component. The early line, only on Sports Grid. You know what? What can one of these quarterbacks or wide receivers do for me this year to make a wager? It's got to be the running conditions there for Jaden Daniels. In regards to Jaden Daniels, you know I was on him in regards to the Heisman Trophy. I actually think he's going to do it on the ground, through the air, 40 touchdowns, four interceptions, playing in Cliff Kingsbury's offense where he wants to spread it and throw it. I think he's going to put up dynamic numbers. Pro football today, only on Sports Grid. The sharpest football contest show in the land. The Las Vegas Football Contest Show focuses on Circus Sports Million, Circus Survivor, and the Westgate Super Contest, handicapping the games and releasing our contest picks every week of the season. With two former Super Contest winners, Brady Cannon and James Salinas, a former NFL player, Mike Pritchard, and over $1 million in contest prize money won combined, the Las Vegas Football Contest Show will have you prepared this season like none other. Welcome back to Newswire here on Sports Grid. Time to dive into some college football. Big games ahead this week, including Alabama, Wisconsin. Really good matchup there. And also, the Jordan Love injury. Has it completely derailed the Green Bay Packers? Let's dive in. It's time now for the Sports Grid Sound Off. All right, we begin with a big matchup this week. By the way, the Alabama Crimson Tide. I mean, I don't know, played a little shaky in that first half last week against the University of South Florida. This week, they're on the road 
taking on the Wisconsin Badgers. A huge game going to be played in Madison this week. Luke Fickle, the head coach, knows what tied week is, regardless of who the coach is. Alabama still ranked inside the top five. It would be a huge win for them. We all know it's a big week, and and this was something that was uh, you know told to me. I think the the day after I took the job, uh, not that I was looking at that in particular as the whole th- thing happened, but uh, over a year and a half ago, this was something that was brought up, and uh, not something that I spent a whole lot of time thinking about uh, until now, and so. This is a great opportunity, and I think our guys are extremely excited. Uh, as we went into fall camp, these were the things that were in front of us, and we knew that. This is you know, kind of the start. Not that the first two games weren't the start of the season, but we knew that this was going to be the opportunity and the point in time when we really, really get to see where we are and who we are. And uh, So that challenge is in front of us, and I think we're really excited about it. Us as coaches like to try to say, hey, what's the routine? We do everything the same way, no matter what it is, the faceless, nameless opponent. Uh, the realities of those things is, is probably not true. Uh, you know, some of us can hide our heads and live under a rock like I do, but our, our guys understand. Our guys are much more aware. Um, and so this was something that had been talked about since spring football. And, and not by me. I'm not like standing up there and say, hey, this is uh, this is Alabama week in spring ball, and we're going to do this. And we work on the rivalry weeks. We talk about, you know, the teams that we play historically. Uh, we don't talk about some of these games, but our guys are all aware of it and, and – um, so, so for them, it, it's been something that, just like me, it's been in the back of their heads, probably a little bit closer to the front of their heads uh, too often, but uh, it's something where I think they really do understand. Like, this is what makes college football, right? There's two things. College football is great, but rivalries and games like this is what really kind of separates college football from, from everything else. It looks to me like Wisconsin is in a huge spot, getting 15 and a half points this week at home against Alabama. The tie didn't look that great to me last week. All right, you know who did look great? Dylan Rayola, the quarterback of the Nebraska Cornhuskers. I mean, this looks like the best Nebraska quarterback that they've had in a long time. He throttled Colorado this past week, and Matt Rule is off to a really good start with another year running things for the Cornhuskers and thus far they're now ranked in the top 25 and who knows maybe things continue to move forward as Rule talked about the process of getting back to where he wanted this program to be. I think there's so much there's so much on the film from this past game that we're like we have to get corrected and and get better at that I think I think that speaks for itself but yeah I mean yeah we, we, we come here to have high expectations right you come here to play in big games you come here to play in front of that crowd you know you so you get to all the reasons why you come here. So, you know, we expect, we expect to be ranked, but whatever it is, 23rd, 24th, that's not where we want to end up. So, um, you know, go one and know each week and see what happens. And Raiola has played as well as any quarterback right now in college football. I know that a lot of people compare him to Patrick Mahomes. Long way to go there, but he's looked great thus far. Meanwhile, the Green Bay Packers today announced that they will not place Jordan Love on injured reserve. So maybe he won't miss four to six weeks, which is the timeline originally given. Maybe it's only a couple of weeks. But that won't stop our social media correspondent, Christian DeBlock, who is going off on the Packers, saying it's over. Any hope for the Packers to make the playoffs is now all but gone. Personally, I didn't have them getting in to begin with. But now that Jordan Love is out for three to four weeks, they're going to have a lot of ground to make up. Their next four games are against the Colts, the Titans, the Vikings, and the Rams. With Malik Willis under center, I think they go one and three. And in a division that is more competitive now that the Bears are a playoff contender, a bad start could be costly in the end. The Lions and the Bears will finish 1-2 and two in the NFC North as the Packers miss the playoffs. All right, well, we will see indeed if that is the case. But I'm looking at the calendar, and I'm, I'm not seeing November or December. I feel like there's a long way to go for the Packers. But look, that's what you got to have an opinion here on the show, and uh, Christian has his opinion there. Fair enough. All right, coming up next, Sam McQuillan joins us from Legal Sports Report. We'll dive into the latest stock watch on DraftKings, also discuss some ESPN bet topics. You're watching Newswire on SportsGrid. We'll be back right after this. All
it's a new era in CFB to start off this year, put on full display. My take on this game is simple. I, I know some people will be upset about it. Good riddance to the Pac-12. Can you do it in terms of the week to week to week? I don't see a pathway for this team to miss the college football playoffs. We want to make sure you have those best bets in the entirety of our betting cards. That was the game! But he had that he broke it. Was only, going there. only on Sports Grid. Again, four grabs in the first half for just over 30 yards, was injured, came back in briefly, and then had to be carted off. We were pessimistic on Puka Nakua's injury to the same right knee of that being a nothing, just a bursa, and that's it, as per Sean McVay. Uh, we felt there could be a small PCL component. The early line, only on Sports Grid. You know what? What can one of these quarterbacks or wide receivers do for me this year to make a wager? It's got to be the running conditions there for Jaden Daniels. In regards to Jaden Daniels, you know I was on him in regards to the Heisman Trophy. I actually think he's going to do it on the ground, through the air, 40 touchdowns, four interceptions, playing in Cliff Kingsbury's offense where he wants to spread it and throw it. I think he's going to put up dynamic numbers. Pro football today, only on Sports Grid. The sharpest football contest show in the land, the Las Vegas Football Contest Show, focuses on Circus Sports Million, Circus Survivor, and the Westgate Super Contest, handicapping the games and releasing our contest picks every week of the season. With two former Super Contest winners, Brady Cannon and James Salinas, a former NFL player, Mike Pritchard, and over $1 million in contest prize money won combined, the Las Vegas Football Contest Show will have you prepared this season like none other. Welcome back to Newswire here on Sports Crib. Time to be joined now by Sam McQuillan of Legal Sports Report. You can read about all of the topics we discuss here on the show over at LegalSportsReport.com. Sam, great to have you back here on Newswire. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Craig. All right, so let's get started here. And, and Sam, you know, with the beginning of college and pro football season, usually it's launch time for a lot of the different sports betting operators, but not so much in New York for ESPN Bet, one of the sports betting operators that we're keeping a close eye on here in 2024. What do you make of uh, the process here and, and what's going on? Yeah, when um, Penn Entertainment CEO Jay Snowden addressed investors a few weeks ago, uh, he was really gung-ho about launching ESPN Bet in New York, which is obviously the biggest sports betting state, it's one of the highest taxed sports betting states as well. So it's it's really key for the operators there, the ones that have been there for a while, DraftKings and FanDuel kind of have a foothold. And uh, ESPN Bet hadn't launched when the state launched sports betting in 2022. Now they acquired a license from WinBet uh, last December, and that was essentially moving forward their plans to launch. Snowden was really gung-ho about launching before the start of football season. He said we would be in New York uh, by college football week one, which was in back in August 25th, I believe, is when the first college games were played. Now, fast forward, we're going into week two of the NFL season, and ESPN bet still is not in New York. So there's a delay there. You're wondering why. I caught up with the New York State Gaming Commission. They said that they haven't reviewed Penn's license yet. Essentially, they have to review this transfer over from WinBet before they can even launch. Now, the earlier they, the earliest they said that could happen is September 23rd, which is about week four of the NFL season. So once that happens, then the ESPN bet theoretically would be able to launch. So it might not even happen until week four, week five, week six. We don't really know. ESPN bet says it's still working on things, but this kind of uh, throws a wrench in sort of the plans that they had talked about in their last earnings call. They had accounted for New York, a full football season of NFL betting in New York in their guidance, uh, in the revenue that they were telling investors they would make this year. So it's going to be interesting to see how that could possibly impact that as well. Uh, you know, like you alluded to, Craig, launching at the start of football season is really key because that's when everyone's flocking to the new apps. It's kind of when you see people's behavior or patterns start to develop. So 
Um, last year, ESPN Bet launched, I think, in around like week 11, pretty late in NFL season at 17 states at once. Um, but this time, they're only going to be launching in one state, so there's not going to be as much fanfare, not as much attention around it. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see what happens eventually in New York here. Uh, Penn stock has taken a hit because of this. I'm told by investors, they think people are kind of seeing, you know, they promised something, they didn't deliver on it. So unfortunately, this is a story for Penn, um, which has kind of continued with them saying we're going to do this. And then it kind of, you know, delays happen. But that's kind of how things go uh, in the sports betting world. There's a lot of hoops you need to jump through, a lot of, um, you know, approvals you need to get from different parties. It's not just as easy as buying the license. Uh, I'm really interested to see and in what it looks like when they launch in New York eventually with all the promos, things of that nature. They've said they're going to rely more on the ESPN branding, more on the uh, app updates and integrations that they've talked about as well that we still are wondering when that when that's going to come. So um, when they launch in New York, maybe you'll see less promos, maybe you'll see more advertisements. But for now, we're just kind of waiting to see when that's going to happen. Um, and the earliest it can happen um, is September 20th, 24th. So um, we're just going to have to wait till then. Yeah, and a lot of time for the NFL season doesn't have to be right away, but getting a head start is, you know, obviously the key to some of this with getting people, brand new people, betting on the apps. All right, uh, speaking of apps, DraftKings has had an interesting summer initially announcing that they were going to raise the juice on uh, a lot of sports betting by basically saying, we're not raising the juice, we're just going to take money out of your winnings. What the heck? That backfired in a big way. They walked it all back. Stock went down. But now all of a sudden we're seeing a rebound here, Sam. What do you attribute it to? Yeah, it, it's really been an interesting story with this whole DraftKings surcharge uh, fiasco. It's kind of the story that never really goes away, even though it's not, it doesn't exist anymore. They had this plan to charge the, the fee on winning betters uh, for about 12 days, and then they got rid of it, citing negative customer feedback. But that came after the CEO said that it would take a lot of uh, top line deterioration, basically DraftKings losing business to get rid of the plan. So it's been a weird story, but uh, the CEO, uh, Jason Robbins, made some comments uh, late last week about the surcharge, about what went into the thinking and about what they can do in the future. Essentially, they proposed the fee as a way to mitigate high taxes in a few states like Illinois, like New York, Pennsylvania, where the tax rate is about 25%. That came right after Illinois raised its tax rate, which DraftKings said it was going to impact its business by about $50 million next year. So this is essentially their way of passing it down to the better, making it up. And they said, hey, we're going to be able to give you the same promotions, uh, you know, same uh, odds everywhere if we do this. Now they rescinded it, this, uh, citing negative customer feedback. But Robin said they're now exploring a new, more favorable option, which will allow them to mitigate these high taxes and to live customers a really good experience. So that's raising my eyebrows. I'm wondering what exactly you're gonna do if you're not gonna charge a fee on winning betters. Uh, a lot of people have speculated, hey, maybe they'll change the odds in different states. Mm. Maybe they'll make the pricing different. That certainly uh, would not be as transparent on the front end. You wouldn't be seeing a fee coming out of your bet before you place it. You would just see worse odds and really have no way to compare it unless you're looking at other sports books or other states. Uh, we haven't seen sports books do that yet. It's something they've really threatened the uh, Sports Betting Alliance, which lobbied very hard against the Illinois tax hike, was talking about, hey, this is going to drive people to the black market. We're going to make odds worse on legal sports books. We haven't seen that yet. So that's not quite off the table. Robbins didn't specify that that's what they're going to do. Uh, FanDuel has come out and said, we're not going to do anything like that. So It'll be interesting to see how this develops throughout the season and interesting to see how it develops if more states consider tax hikes of their own. Does that force DraftKings to try to come up with another solution? Robbins seemed pretty proud of the way they handled it. He said it was very deliberate. We tested something. We tried it. We got negative customer feedback. We never actually went through with the fee, so no harm, no foul. That's not exactly lining up with the comments he made before they started it. So it's still a little strange that we even had this to begin with, but largely the impact on the stock on the company has been forgotten. DraftKings is back up to about $36 a share, which is about what it was three or four months ago before it really took a nosedive after this whole surcharge plan. We've seen throughout football season, the stock does really well in the first couple of weeks. So I'd expect that to kind of be the same story here. Um, especially as Wall Street says, you know, they never actually did this. So it's just a weird kind of thing that happened. And we're trying to move on from, but I'm not going to forget about it. We're going to see what they come up with in the future. It sounds like they're certainly not done uh, with mitigating this whole high tax uh, burden. 
nope, they don't like it. And I don't think it's going away. Neither is the story. Sam, thanks again for coming on Newswire. Really appreciate it. Yep, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Craig. All right. If you bet on the Jets in New York last night, you were not a winner. They lost to the San Francisco Giants, did not cover the spread, did not come close. 32-19 uh, to 19 was the final yesterday as the Jets pick up the win on Monday Night Football. After the game yesterday, Aaron Rodgers certainly expressing his disappointment and essentially just saying we did not play well. Yeah, you know, we were just bad uh, on first and second down, I think, for a lot of the game. And then, you know, we had a couple drives. We converted third downs. But overall, you know, we, we – uh, uh, we, I feel like we didn't have any third and ten pluses tonight, so that's always a good thing. We look in the stat sheet, but uh, we didn't convert those third and mediums. Um, you know, we had a drop, we had a couple uh, penalties, had a bad throw, so a um, lot to correct. But overall, I feel, you know, I feel good about our guys. I thought the protection was really good tonight. Um, we just were a little bit off in the in the run game. Couldn't get Brees going. Couldn't give him enough space. Um, but a lot to build on. Jets Titans this week, two teams coming off 0-1 disappointing performances, but not disappointing are the Buffalo Bills. And coming up next, Dan Fates is going to join us here on the show. We'll break down what the NFL is loving right now. They hate the story of what happened with Tyreek Hill, but the fact that it did happen and the Dolphins play again this week is going to get a lot of attention. Can they beat the Bills this week? Dan weighs in next. A new era in CFB to start off this year, put on full display. My take on this game is simple. I, I know some people will be upset about it. Good riddance to the Pac-12. Can you do it in terms of the week to week to week? I don't see a pathway for this team to miss the college football playoffs. We want to make sure you have those best bets in the entirety of our betting cards. That was so exciting! But he had that he the the going there. Only on Sports Grid. Again, four grabs in the first half for just over 30 yards, was injured, came back in briefly, and then had to be carted off. We were pessimistic on Puka Nakua's injury to the same right knee of that being a nothing, just a bursa, and that's it, as per Sean McVay. Uh, we felt there could be a small PCL component. The early line, only on Sports Grid. You know what? What can one of these quarterbacks or wide receivers do for me this year to make a wager? It's got to be the running conditions there for Jaden Daniels. In regards to Jaden Daniels, you know I was on him in regards to the Heisman Trophy. I actually think he's going to do it on the ground, through the air, 40 touchdowns, four interceptions, playing in Cliff Kingsbury's offense where he wants to spread it and throw it. I think he's going to put up dynamic numbers. Pro football today, only on Sports Grid. The sharpest football contest show in the land. The Las Vegas Football Contest Show focuses on Circus Sports Million, Circus Survivor, and the Westgate Super Contest, handicapping the games and releasing our contest picks every week of the season. With two former Super Contest winners, Brady Cannon and James Salinas, a former NFL player, Mike Pritchard, and over $1 million in contest prize money won combined, the Las Vegas Football Contest Show will have you prepared this season like none other. Welcome back to Newswire here on Sports Grid. Quick turnaround, as always, for the National Football League. Dan Fates is with us to preview the game coming up this week. Bills and Dolphins in South Florida. Dan, of course, covering the Bills in Rochester for ABC 13. And, uh, Dan, I mean, this is going to be one of those classic matchups, I feel like, on Thursday Night Football. Uh, added with, uh, you know, some extra stuff, I guess is the easiest way to say it, with what happened with the Dolphins off the field before the game. So naturally, I think high ratings are in store for Thursday night. 
Yeah, and there's always high ratings when it's Josh Allen and it's against the Dolphins. For whatever reason, Josh has owned the Dolphins. He is 11-2 and two in his career against Miami, and the two seem to constantly – take subtle jabs at one another. It was last year the Bills post or the Dolphins posted all their social media with the thinking emoji. Josh Allen runs in a touchdown. His celebration is the emoji as well. So there's never a shortage of storylines when these two teams meet. That's for sure. Yeah. And coming off, let's go back to the Bills here and then we'll go to the matchup here. But, uh, you yeah. know, the Bills uh, did not play well in, in that first half against Arizona. I mean, Kyler Murray was having his way. Uh, with the defense of the Buffalo Bills. And then the second half, of course, was a different story. The Bills played a lot better. They gave up that kickoff return. And I think that's what you know kept them in the game. They ended up covering the spread, by the way. Six and a half was the point spread there. Uh, anything to be concerned about with the Bills defense here? Because certainly giving up several touchdowns, albeit one on a kick return, was not, I think, what people expected. Yeah, I think the defensive line was a little bit of a concern for me. Obviously, I knew that Arizona had a good running game. James Conner ran the ball extremely well. And it's funny. Could we call that vintage Kyler Murray? I know he's not been in the league that long, but when Kyler Murray is really good, that's what he looks like. They had the Bills off balance, and it was the first game that defensive coordinator Bobby Babbage was calling plays. So I expected a little bit of a learning curve. But in classic Sean McDermott fashion, they made adjustments at halftime. We saw that a lot last year, Craig. There was times when the opening kickoff would go, the other team would march down the field, score in the opening drive, and I'm on the field, and, and my phone's blowing up in my mention saying Sean McDermott can't coach, that, that he doesn't know what he's doing, can't make any plays. And then he'd give up, like, six points the rest of the game. It, the Bills' defense is really good at making adjustments, and it's funny because – they always talk about, oh, halftime adjustments aren't really a thing. You know, it's just a couple minutes. You go to the bathroom, you go back out in the field. But the Bills have done a really good job in the Sean McDermott era of making those adjustments. So the secondary was was really good with DeMar Hamlin getting the start, Taylor Rapp in place. I think there was only something like three passes that were thrown against the two corners in mm. Rasul Douglas and Christian Benford and only allowed two catches. Like the back half of the defense, even without Poyer and Micah Hyde, was still really good. Yeah, and, and, and I think that that's the key here because the Dolphins are going to try and throw on the Bills. There's no question about that. Before we get to that, so yeah. you saw what happened last night on Monday Night Football, I'm sure, with Christian McCaffrey being declared out right before the game, running back afterwards yeah. said he knew he was starting. We don't know if that's the case. So I, I'm always very careful with injuries in the NFL just to say this is much ado about nothing. So you tell me. I mean, Josh Allen scores that touchdown, yeah. looks at his wrist, says he's going to play, he's going to be fine. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't buy anything anymore, Dan, honestly. Like, at this point, I don't know what to believe in the NFL because they're able to keep this stuff so secretive. I know that's not going to affect his throwing at all, but what I don't want right. to say is, Dan, this is going to be a nothing, and then all of a sudden the snap is fumbled, and we go, hey, I, maybe he's not okay, you know? So what is the latest there? Well, he, he runs in, he hurdles another, he hurdles Buda Baker, goes to the end zone, and as I'm watching it, I, it almost looks like he got up before to celebrate to like make sure he still had all of his arms and, and hands and was kind of looking around. And then we see him get taped up like an offensive lineman gets taped up on his left wrist. And again, Josh is as tough as they come. And Sean McDermott is usually pretty coy with the injury report. We know Taron Johnson's out, but he says we still have to do further research on the timetable for when he returns. But with Josh, he said he was cleared to go. Josh didn't wear any brace or anything like that when he went to the post-game press conference, got x-rays. He landed on his wrist. Like, there's no question. And more than anything, it seemed to impede his handoffs. I know that sounds weird, but it's his left hand. You're still handing the ball off on runs right. to the right side with your left hand as a quarterback. So that was a little clunky. And obviously, Craig, you can't do this all the time time right like it looked like josh was playing in a playoff game that they needed to win to go to the oh, yeah. super bowl Th that was that was a little bit more of the concern is we know that josh is you know a, a, a cyborg he's he's a mutant when it comes to being six five and 230 and being able to run over linebackers but it was week one and we're already talking about an injury to josh allen i know it's his non-throwing hand but it's still hard not to think of the back of your head there's something to think of there but again yeah. Clear to practice, will play Thursday night. Yeah, no, I, I mean, we went, we spent the whole preseason hearing again how this wasn't going to happen, and it happened immediately in, in week one of, of the NFL season. Uh, so this is an interesting prop here for his passing total, 240 and a half going into this week. I didn't know that against the Dolphins over on FanDuel, 
that he's gone over this total six games in a row against Miami. And so I still don't think we necessarily, Dan, have the answer to who is Josh Allen going to throw to all the time. I don't feel like we got that in the in this past game, but maybe we'll learn a little bit more on Thursday night. Yeah, that was, again, I said I wasn't going to overreact on the Buffalo Plus YouTube channel about the fact of I wasn't going to overreact to week one, one way or another. This Josh took... 10 snaps in the preseason. He only threw three passes and all of these new weapons. And I think the last time I was on your show, we talked about all these mm-hmm. new wide receivers and how would they function? And we didn't know anything more before the preseason than we did after the preseason. And I don't know anything more about who Josh yeah. Allen's go-to guy is heading into week two than I did into week one. The plus side is 10 different players, 10 different bills, I believe caught passes, but Dalton Kincaid only caught one. No wide receiver had more than three. Like, There is some concern that when the Bills get down and Josh needs to make a play on third and 14, he's just going to go back into the phone booth, put on the Superman cape, and try and run Mm. over 10 Dolphins on Thursday night. It didn't look, like you said, a slow start. It didn't look like there was the rhythm. And you can talk about they should have played in the preseason or whatever. I don't buy that. It's about executing. And for the most part, it wasn't there yet. When will they get there? Hopefully soon. But again, it helps when you have Josh Allen, who is a unicorn on the football field. No, it really is. I mean, it, I, I was told it would be Kincaid by default. That was not the case in week one where Buffalo scored a million points either. So we'll, we'll just yeah. keep watching, Dan. I know you will be too. Thanks again for coming on Newswire, as always. Thanks again, guys. All right, big, big game Thursday night. Dolphins, Bills early in the season. We'll take a break and be back with last list. era in cfb to start off this year put on full display my take on this game is simple i i know some people will be upset about it good riddance to the pac-12 can you do it in terms of the week to week to week i don't see a pathway for this team to miss the college football playoffs we want to make sure you have those best bets in the entirety of our betting cards that was so exciting but he had that he one he was going going there. only on sports grid and four grabs in the first half for just over 30 yards, was injured, came back in briefly, and then had to be carted off. We were pessimistic on Puka Nakua's injury to the same right knee of that being a nothing, just a bursa, and that's it, as per Sean McVay. Uh, we felt there could be a small PCL component. The early line, only on Sports Grid. You know what? What can one of these quarterbacks or wide receivers do for me this year to make a wager? It's got to be the running conditions there for Jaden Daniels. In regards to Jaden Daniels, you know I was on him in regards to the Heisman Trophy. I actually think he's going to do it on the ground, through the air, 40 touchdowns, four interceptions, playing in Cliff Kingsbury's offense where he wants to spread it and throw it. I think he's going to put up dynamic numbers. Pro football today, only on SportsGrid. The sharpest football contest show in the land. The Las Vegas Football Contest Show focuses on Circus Sports Million, Circus Survivor, and the Westgate Super Contest. Handicapping the games and releasing our contest picks every week of the season. With two former Super Contest winners, Brady Cannon and James Salinas, a former NFL player, Mike Pritchard, and over $1 million in contest prize money won combined, the Las Vegas Football Contest Show will have you prepared this season like none other. Welcome back to Newswire here on Sports Grid. Time for us to dive into some hot topics surrounding the National Football League. We'll touch on the 49ers running back situation a little bit. A uh, Patriots defender has a big game and then is asked to participate in something afterward. We'll tell you what. And also one less Sanders on the field for Colorado in the future. It's time now for some last licks. (laughs) 
Okay, so in case you missed it last night, let me review. Christian McCaffrey, who is arguably one of the most important offensive players in the National Football League, and also, for those of you who play fantasy football, in all leagues, probably the number one pick overall in the draft, was expected to play on Monday Night Football against the New York Jets. But a couple hours before, it was declared that he would be inactive for the game, which shocked a lot of people. And maybe it didn't shock the starting running back for the game. His name is Jordan Mason, who had a career game last night against the New York Jets. Afterward, he was asked when he learned about being the starter at running back for the 49ers, and he told the reporter that he found out that he was starting on Friday. Well, there is a problem because the injury reports did not have Christian McCaffrey as out. They did not have him as doubtful to play on Monday Night Football. And then again, this is not something that's tolerated by the NFL. The head coach, Kyle Shanahan, after the game said that he never told Mason that he was starting on Friday and maybe it came from one of the coaches. And then Mason himself walked that back in the post-game podium saying that this is why he doesn't talk to the media. Very bizarre situation going on in San Francisco, and nothing significant is going to come out of this. Maybe the 49ers get fined or something or something else, but I guess the bottom line is from this game is that if you draft Christian McCaffrey in fantasy football, you probably have to have his handcuffed. <laughs> That's probably the biggest takeaway for me in that game. All right, a uh, big, big game for Keon White of the New England Patriots against the Cincinnati Bengals. A dominant defensive performance for the Patriots, and White himself – had two and a half sacks in the game. So what happened was immediately after, of course, he has this big game, he's feeling really good about things, and then they have a day off, and then what happens? Keon White shows up, and the National Football League says, you know what, you had such a big game, let's go ahead and see if you're on anything. That's probably not what happened. But that is exactly what happened, as Keon White was drug tested after the game and put out a very funny social media post this is what happens on my day off. Two and a half sacks for a, uh, you know, a good player. But a, let's let's be honest, a little bit anonymous. When you hear two and a half sacks, who do you think of, right? You hear, you think of uh, TJ Watt, right? Two and a half sacks. You don't think of, of Keon White, but he did it. He got drug tested. I'm assuming he passed, although I haven't heard that yet. But good job by the Patriots defense against the Bengals. They played awful. Okay, well, uh, Shadur Sanders, he is the quarterback of the Colorado Buffaloes. Deion Sanders is the head coach of the Colorado Buffaloes and the defensive player on the Colorado Buffaloes. His name is Shiloh Sanders. He is Deion's other son. Unfortunately for Shiloh, he was hurt in the game against Nebraska on Saturday night. You may have seen him, if you were paying attention, on the sidelines wearing a soft cast or a brace or something. As it turns out, unfortunately for Shiloh, he had to have surgery, and there is Dad Dion saying that he is uh, out, but potentially going to be back. We don't know in the future, but the bottom line is, is that one less Sanders on the field for the Buffs. Don't like to see this. I will say that I watched that game. I try to watch as much college football as I can. I got a lot of stuff going on, so it's like to, to watch all of Saturday and all of Sunday is not easy for me, especially hosting the Saturday show too, but I did watch this. I, I thought the Buffaloes were awful on Saturday night. And I, and I try to give Dion the benefit of the doubt with all this stuff because I was a big Dion fan, primetime, Cowboys, Falcons, uh, 49ers, everything. But that team looked awful against Nebraska. Terrible on, on Sunday. Getting seven and a half points, it could have got 30. Wouldn't have made a difference. But speedy recovery, we're wishing for uh, Shiloh. Uh, okay, let's do this. Uh, let me tell you about what's coming up next here on Newswire. Of course, we have a great show planned for you tomorrow as we get ready for Thursday Night Football. But guess what? Coming up at 1 o'clock Eastern, we got Scott Kaplan in the house. So make sure you stay tuned. Kaplan and crew, 1 p.m. Eastern. That is followed by, of course, Scott Farrell, Coast to Coast at 3. Game time decisions, in-game live, and then some great shows tonight with Gabe for Sports Rage overnight as well. Also want to thank our guest contributors here on the program, Dan Fates from ABC in Rochester. Also thanks to Matt Latusky for coming on the show and Sam McQuillan. And for my director, Luke, and my producer, Frank, I'm Craig Mish. Enjoy the rest of your day here on Sports Grid. I'll see you tomorrow, same time, same place, for our next edition of Newswire. See you then. <laughs>